G'day, this is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of Life Studies. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. Tonight's the first part of uh, a study on Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, again, just so that we are able to understand what they, uh, what they believe, what their doctrines are, um, and so that we can better uh, witness to them and, and share the truth with them. Um, it's going to be a two-parter, uh, simply because it's just too much stuff to do in one night. Um, so in the introduction, Jehovah Witnesses worldwide, only 8.7 million. Um, last time we looked at Roman Catholicism, there was about 1.3 billion. But Jehovah Witnesses, 8.7 million. There's only about 110,000 in Australia. Um, so it's not many. We know that they operate from their kingdom halls. Um, and uh, they have a governing body of eight men who oversee the whole thing, and they're based in New York. Uh, it's founded by a guy called um, Charles, uh, um, the founder of the organization that came to be known as Jehovah Witnesses was a guy called Charles Taze Russell, 1852 to 1916. <laughs> he had a very strong fear of hell. Um, and he didn't like um, the way that uh, <laughs> the Presbyterian church was uh, was preaching about hell. So he, he left that, joined up with the uh, Adventists. Um, and uh, he began to teach Bible classes, which is how he got the title of pastor. Pastor Russell, they called him Pastor Russell. Um, it was never ordained. And he started to write books and pamphlets, and his teaching and his writings uh, were strongly um, uh, influenced by Adventism, especially in the view of hell and the time of Christ's coming. So when he began to disagree with the Adventists in several points, especially the atonement, he launched his own magazine called Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. Um, five years later, in 1884, he founded Zion's Watchtower Tract Society and made it a non-profit organization. And then in 1896, uh, it was renamed as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. In 1908, they moved the headquarters to Brooklyn, New York. He promoted his modified Adventism um, through his writings, uh, and he actually wrote a seven volume series called Studies in the Scriptures, even though he was not, he, he purported to be to understand Hebrew and Greek, but he actually, when he went to court for something, he, he couldn't even tell the alphabet of the Greek. So he, he wasn't very, he wasn't very knowledgeable. Uh, he's extremely egotistical, um, and he made some pretty absurd claims about his writings. And his, his, actually, his wife had enough of him. <laughs> she reckons he was a he was a scammer, and she actually sued him for divorce in 1913 on the grounds of adultery, conceit, egotism, and domination. Um, yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses disclaim any connection with with uh, with this guy, but his doctrines are the same as the doctrines of the Jehovah Witnesses movement today. So the doctrines that he put in place, they're still in place today. But but the uh, the actual movement disassociated associated themselves from him because he, you know he was a had a bad reputation. Another guy called Joseph Franklin Rutherford took over, and he in 1917, and he was a he was a judge, and uh, he gained absolute control over the Watchtower Society. And in 1931, following Isaiah 43:10, he renamed the movement Jehovah's Witnesses in an attempt to uh, disassociate themselves completely with Pastor Russell who was the guy who started it all off. Now, he also denounced all organized religions, and uh, he actually stirred his uh, followers up to be very hostile toward Christianity. Um, and uh, this guy actually built on the teachings of, of Russell, and then he actually wrote even more than Russell. Then we had another guy called Nathan Ho McNor. He followed Rutherford. And under his leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, 
stressed intense intense training for their disciples and then the image of the movement changed it became a little bit more respectable and highly organized and the movement's training of its laymen and its leaders took place in what we know today as the kingdom halls their latest president was a guy called robert saranko and he actually died last year of covid so he's gone not sure who the new one is now, why are, JW, why are the Jehovah Witnesses so zealous in their door knocking? Um, simply because the witnesses teach that Christ's second coming had, has already occurred um, back in 1874. Unbeknownst to everybody, uh, Christ came to the upper air and he caught up the apostles and dead members of the 144,000 who will be immortal. Um, so straight away you think, hang on, what are they talking about? 144,000, that's down in Revelation. Anyway, so in 1914, they said that Christ ended the times of the Gentiles and he began to reign. Obviously, they don't know what the times of the Gentiles are. And in 1918, he now came to the spiritual temple and began the judgment of the nations. So that's what they believe. And so Jehovah's Witness... They're all now awaiting the imminent battle of Armageddon. That's what they're waiting for because, you know, Christ has already come and all these things. So next thing for them is the battle of Armageddon. And then Jesus will lead the forces of Jehovah to defeat evil. Yeah. And the faithful witnesses, the faithful Jehovah witnesses, they will escape death in this battle. <clears throat> And here is why they're so good at door knocking. Only those who earn their place through door knock uh, work are the saved. So they need to knock on as many doors as they can and do as much work as they can so that we be amongst the saved. Now, looking at the Watchtower and the Tract Society, this is the Jehovah Witness Authority. Now, in Matthew 24, 45, they, they use this um, to set themselves apart. Matthew 24, 45 says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? So the Watchtower Society believe themselves to be the faithful and wise servant and uh, actually passed the first pastor, well, the guy who was set up as the first pastor, Pastor um, Charles Russell, who was the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses movement, was once considered the faithful and wise servant. But because of his, his, uh, his skullduggeries and all the, the crooked deals he did, uh, witnesses today deny that he ever was, you know, this faithful and wise servant but actually all the literature still has it in it that he is in fact the watchtower book the harp of god states without a doubt pastor russell filled the office and was therefore that wise and faithful servant and that's in page 239 of that book the harp of god and today <clears throat> watchtower literature uh, again tells us that Christ's anointed followers viewed as a group are now God's collective faithful and wise servant or slave. The governing body of the Watchtower Society in Brooklyn and New York, these are the guys who lead this group. And so we see here now in Matthew 24, 45 to 49, um, he goes on to say here, um, they use this text to prove to, to the world, you know, that they are the, the Watchtower Society, are the faithful servant. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. If the other wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards. Now, can this 
re can this really mean that the faithful servant is the Watchtower Society? Because that's what they claim. Uh, the Watchtower Society claims that they are the faithful and wise servant of which Jesus speaks in this passage. But they're not. Uh, what Jehovah's Witnesses are doing with this passage, and which they do with pretty much all of their passages, is eisegesis, which means what they're doing is they're reading a meaning into the text instead of practicing exegesis by getting the meaning out of the text. So they're reading themselves, uh, the Watchtower Society, into the text saying that, hey, this is who we are. We are the faithful and wise servant. But what, in this parable, what's Jesus doing? Jesus is simply, he likens a follower or disciple, an individual, to a servant who's been put in charge of his master's household. And is it, in this parable, Jesus, he now contrasts <clears throat> two possible ways that each professed disciple could, could, could walk, either faithfully or unfaithfully. Um, and each servant has the potential to be either. Now, the servant who chooses to be faithful, he conscientiously goes about his duties and, and you know, he, he, he's thinking about his master uh, while he's away, making sure that he does everything right. He honours the, the position of, of uh, steward and uh, he pays careful attention to the details of the task that he's given and seeks to avoid um, living carelessly and becoming, you know, pretty lazy in his service. Uh, so he governs his life that, so that he'll be prepared whenever his master returns. And, and that's the faithful servant. But then by contrast, is Jesus telling this parable, there's another servant, but he chooses to be unfaithful. And he says, look, my master's going to be away for a long time. Um, so I'm just going to I'm going to give the other servants heaps. I'm going to beat them up. And I'm going to live it up for myself on the master's money, that is. And so he lives uh, very carelessly, very recklessly. And uh, he doesn't fulfill his responsibilities to his master. So what we see here is that this, this servant here is a servant only in name. It's, it's not, he's, he's a hypocrite. He's, he's not a true servant. So this parable indicates, what does it indicate? It simply indicates to us that those who profess to serve Christ must make a, a choice. Be faithful servants doing the Lord's will at all times or be unfaithful. And those who are faithful will be rewarded um, and enter his, his kingdom. However, what, we, what we're talking about here is the Watchtower Society. Uh, this passage is not referring to an organization, uh, the Watchtower Society. Uh, uh, because, you know, that, is, that, is, that, is, that organization, the, the Watchtower Society, is permanently distinct from a separate group apostate Christendom. So what it's referring to here is it's to all who profess to follow Christ and it's simply um, encouraging them to be faithful in, in, their, in their service. Uh, there is no way you could um, read the Watchtower Society into this passage, except if you're the Watchtower Society and they read themselves into this passage as the wise and faithful servant now, the Watchtower teaches also that Isaiah 43.10, Isaiah 43.10, it says, you are my witnesses. Um, in fact, this is where they got the name from. Uh, and you are my witnesses is the utterance of Jehovah, even my servant whom I have chosen. So, you know, uh, uh, Tell uh, what's his name that the second guy he looks at this and they appropriate this verse for themselves and the Jehovah Jehovah witnesses uh, believe that out of all the religious groups on the planet earth that they alone are chosen by God and have been deemed his witnesses that they are the that that eight million people are the only people on this earth who God has chosen to be his witnesses. And they base it on this passage here, um, Isaiah 43.10 and Matthew, the passage we just read before. But the con remember, 
context, context, context. The context here is referring purely to Israel uh, as being a witness to God's, uh, you know, his, his glory and his authority and, and, and his, his majesty. Uh, and, and so Israel, uh, right, it is the witness uh, to God, uh, as God, is God's witness to the pagan nations around about them saying, listen, this is our God. Uh, this was to testify to the pagan nations that Yahweh is the only true God, that the Lord is the only true God. So it's a very wild, it's a very huge stretch of the imagination uh, to you to, to take a verse that is referring to Israel in, in Isaiah. Um, now we're in Isaiah, does it ever talk about uh, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses? Um, and uh, trying to take this verse uh, referring to Israel as God's witness to the pagan nations in the in the Old Testament times, which was you know like seven seven hundred years before the time of Christ, and claim its fulfilment in a modern day religious group some nineteen centuries after the time of Christ. So. If JW, Jehovah Witnesses, were the only true witnesses, then what we would see then is for a period of 18 centuries of church history, it meant that God was without a witness in the world. So that in itself is a foo-foo. It's rubbish. Absolute rubbish. So, you know, you got to ask them, well, you know, if that's the case, didn't God care whether people understood the Bible or not? You know, if you guys are the only witnesses, um, because we see from Christ's ascension to the birth of Jehovah Witnesses in the 1900s, there was no witness, according to them. And if the Jehovah Witnesses are the only true witnesses for God, and if Jehovah Witnesses as an organization came into being in the late 19th century, which is, which is a, a fact that we know, does this mean that God was without a witness for over 18 centuries of church history? My gosh, I'd better tell Paul and the apostles that. Now, in the New Testament, where the clear focus is not on being witnesses of Jehovah, which is what they claim, they claim that they're witnesses of Jehovah, not of Jesus, but of Jehovah. Um, uh, the, the, the New Testament apostles, they were all witnesses of Jesus Christ. In fact, the disciples uh, became Christ's witnesses, not Jehovah's witnesses, but Christ's witnesses. And the, the theme, for instance, in, uh, in their, in their um, witness and testimony was Christ's bodily physical resurrection from the dead and in fact uh, that's the that's the heart of the gospel in first corinthians 15 1 to 4 um, and it, it's also made a matter of salvation by the apostle paul in acts chapter 2 verse 32 what does it say this jesus god raised up and of that we are all witnesses it does not say that they're witnesses of jehovah witnesses of jesus again acts 3 15 you kill the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. Now, it's important that we realize this because uh, as we go along, uh, you'll, you'll see something. Uh, you'll say, whoa, how did they do that? So these, uh, this uh, Watchtower Society, uh, they believe that God personally set them up on earth. You know, God came to them and says, right, you guys are going to be my witnesses to the entire humanity. Uh, and what they say is that God only uses the Watchtower Society and its literature to teach the Bible to humanity. There is no one else can do it except the Watchtower Society. And without the society and its literature, <clears throat> nobody can understand the meaning of the scriptures because it needs to be explained by the them watchtower tracks that they come around and give you so without the society and its literature one cannot understand the meaning of scripture and so what they're saying is that the watchtower society is the sole possessor 
and the sole propagator of God's truth. And so every Jehovah's Witness is expected to obey the society as the voice of God because the society, there's, there's eight men uh, in, there in New York, uh, they speak the voice of God. They are God's only representative on earth. Now, if that's the case, what we find is that the witnesses, the Jehovah Witnesses, must always obey the Watchtower Society's doctrines over any government directives. So, for instance, you know, if today the government says everybody must have the COVID vaccine and the Watchtower Society says, no, we will not have the vaccine. Well, the Jehovah Witnesses have to obey the society's directive, not the government. Um, and, you know, that's why we, we, we're going to see later on, they have all sorts of issues with, with uh, transfusions and all sorts of things. So this society, this Watchtower Society, is an organisation, and what it does, it simply it directs the minds of God's people. And we see that in, in the Watchtower that came out in, on, the, on the 1st of March, 1983. It's, it tells them that this Watchtower Society, we're the ones who virtually tell you how you're going to think. And the Watchtower states that we must recognize not only Jehovah God as our father, but his organization, which is the Watchtower Society, as our mother and this is in their watchtower magazine which came out in the, on the 1st of may 1957 so this watchtower society acts as infallible interpreters of scripture and no deviations are tolerated none whatsoever you tow the line um, in, in in actual fact um, uh, no Jehovah Witness has a right to his own inductive judgment. No one can, uh, can study the scriptures on their own and come to a conclusion. If one disobeys the instructions of, so of the society, you know, even just a minor infraction will bring disfellowship. And this is what, uh, this is what keeps our witnesses obedient to the doctrine out of fear of being disfellowshipped and if uh, if a person is disfellowshipped from the society the, uh, the jehovah witnesses it means then that only immediate family or husband or a wife can communicate with the disfellowship one for only necessary business not for a catch up for a coffee or anything because that's not necessary business only necessary business so fear of this fellowship uh, is high on their agenda. And so, you know, if you were to even uh, uh, do a little bit of Bible study yourself and go to a meeting and said, well, I was just doing a little bit of uh, delving into the scriptures here. And you know what? I found a concordance or a addiction says this. And they said, what are you doing? You have to go by way of the, the Watchtower Society's uh, magazine. Now, the, the doctrines of uh, Jehovah Witnesses, uh, they actually place reason above the teaching of the Bible. So what that means is that they reject anything in Scripture that is beyond man's understanding. Um, so, for instance, they, there's a denial of the Trinity because they can't fathom it. So there's a denial of the doctrine of the Trinity there's a denial of the doctrine of the God man, Jesus. There's a, a denial of the deity of Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit. Um, they deny also Christ's bodily resurrection and his second coming, his physical second coming. So they deny all these things. Now, we also have, along with the Watchtower, um, uh, society with their magazines, which, which are coming out constantly. We have the New World Translation. Yeah, the New World Translation, what is that? This is their Bible. Now, 
when they come to your door, they'll claim that the Bible is their final authority for truth. Uh, the Bible, they claim, the Bible is 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 uh, considered the divine, the divinely inspired and infallible Word of God. However, it is the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures, published by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. So. In actual fact, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses' real authority is their, is their official system of interpretation. It's not actually the, the Bible. It's the way that the Bible has now been uh, mutilated to present their form of doctrine. Yeah. Jehovah Witnesses, uh, they are told through Watchtower publications that God's true name is Jehovah, J-E-H-A-V-A-H. And they're also taught that it was the Jews that removed this name from the Bible. But no need to worry because the Watchtower president, uh, Nathan Knorr, uh, at the time he solved the problem, he says, hey, we're going to produce our own Bible and the New World Translation, the NWT, was now produced and published by the Watchtower Society. And what they say is where all the names of Jehovah have been removed, we have now inserted them all. And so this has faithfully restored the divine name in the Old Testament where the Hebrew consonants Y-H-W-H appear. Uh, and also what they've done is um, not only have they uh, inserted the name Jehovah into the Old Testament where that Y-H-W-H was, they've now also inserted it into the New Testament wherever the text refers to the Father. So... In the Old Testament, Jehovah has been inserted 6,828 6, times. And in the New Testament, 237 times. And they, uh, they did this even though it contradicts the thousands of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. The New Testament always uses the word Lord, uh, a Greek kurios, and God, Greek, Theos, never Jehovah, even when they're quoting the Old Testament, Jehovah is never used in the New Testament. But, uh, but they come along and everywhere the word Father is, like God the Father, you know, whatever, they put Jehovah. They insert Jehovah. And so what we see here is that the um, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, believe that the New World Translation is the best translation available today. And they'll often point to the importance of using God's correct name, Jehovah. And they also believe that because they are the only group that refers to God by his true name, Jehovah, it means that they are the only true followers of God. And if that's the case, what they say is everybody else, all groups that don't use Jehovah are satanic groups. And that's where they, that's the, the, uh, the bias that they're coming from. Now, in the, uh, the occurrence of the divine name in the Old Testament, the name is, uh, well, we don't know actually how it's pronounced. Let's just say it's Yahweh, which is Y-H-W-H, a tetragrammaton. Um, it's translated Lord, which is all capitals, L-O-R-D. And it occurs 6,828 times in the Old Testament. And then there's another name called Adonai, um, which is Lord, but with lowercase O-R-D. And that occurs 442 times in the Old Testament. So what they did with these things is they replaced them with the name Jehovah. Now, 
Um, you say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, the thing is that Jehovah, well, well where did it come from, for instance? Uh, Jehovah is not actually found in the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts from which uh, we get our English translations of the Bible. Um, uh, the Old Testament contains the name, uh, well, YH, WH, the, uh, the Tetragrammaton. Um, uh, we, we say it as Yahweh. Um, remember, the Hebrew only had consonants. That's why there's no vowels in there. Um, so where did this name Jehovah come from? We need to remember that the, uh, the Jews, the Old Testament Jews, well, and the Jews today, uh, they would simply not um, pronounce the name YHWH. Um, why? Because they, they felt that if they, if they used his name, it, it might violate the, uh, one of the commandments which deals with taking God's name in vain. So they simply would not pronounce it. In fact, nobody knows how it's actually pronounced because nobody's ever used it. <laughs> so to avoid the possibility of breaking uh, this commandment, what the Jews did was they substituted the name Adonai, uh, Lord, uh, or some other name in its place whenever they came across it in, in uh, as they were public reading the scriptures. Um, you'll even see today that uh, um, sometimes if they put an ad in the newspaper, they'll have G uh, dash D. They won't say God. Um, but later on, what happened was the scribes then decided that they were going to insert the vowels from Adonai, which is, you know, A, O, A, uh, within the consonants of Y, H, W, H. And the result was Yehovah, or or Jehovah. So the word Jehovah is is derived from a consonant uh, vowel combination from the words uh, Y H W H and Adonai. Now Watchtower actually does acknowledge this fact. Yeah, they say yes, we agree with that. Um, but the, the, the simple point here is that the term Jehovah, strictly speaking, is it's not actually a biblical term. Um, it's a man-made term that is used to render the, the Hebrew term uh, YHWH. -Y -H -H. Um, now, even though there's no um, justification, biblical justification for the term Jehovah, uh, we just need to, well, in, in fact, scholars are not clear how to pronounce the Hebrew um, YHWH. So they simply don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, in, in actual fact, also, there are, there are actually other translations um, besides the New World Translation, uh, which are legitimate translations. For instance, uh, I, I use the, uh, the ASV 1901, the American Standard Version 1901, and uh, that has that uses the word Jehovah in it, um, and we also have, for instance, the King James uh, uses it four times in 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 its in its translation. Um, you know, m most people have accepted um, the term Jehovah as the you know as as a way as a, a normal way of referring to God. Um, the big beef with the Jehovah Witnesses is, is not uh, is not the term itself, but it's how they actually use the term in their in their interpretation and their theology. That that's the that's the, that's the big beef. That's what we're going to see uh, in in next week. Um, now the New World Translation, it's uh, it's it is totally it's it's inaccurate. It's misleading. And, uh, you know, it's, it's translated to favor the Watchtower Society theology. Um, um, you know, the translate, in fact, the translators of the, of the New World Translation were not um, biblical linguists. Um, in fact, the Watchtower wouldn't identify uh, anybody who translated it uh, um, because they said, well, you know, they're very humble people. And uh, they prepare, uh, they want to remain anonymous because you know we just want to give God the glory. Um, 
So that was the claim. The problem with that is that, uh, well, if we don't know who they are, we can't see what qualifications they have to do the translation. And uh, in their past, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Russell there, who, you know, the, the first guy who, you know, said he knew Hebrew and, and Greek, in actual fact, uh, when he was in court for, um, he, he brought up an, an fraud charges, I think it was, um, you know, and, and his, uh, you know, his, his proclamations that he, you know, he was this scholar, a Greek and Hebrew scholar, when they asked him to, uh, you know, translate the Hebrew, the, the Greek alphabet, he, he couldn't even tell what the alphabet was. So um, it's pretty much uh, through the system that, that they're not uh, actual linguists. Uh, they just translated how they needed to, to look for their 8 million followers. Okay, so this is just the intro this week. Next week, we're going to look at how they, what they do with Jesus's name, you know, John 1.1, 1, 1, you know, uh, uh, all the things that when they come to your door and they said, well, you know, here it is here, you, we can say to them, well, that's not what the actual Bible says. That's not what the Greek says. Um, we just need to be able to understand where they're coming from. And also, we also need to realize that uh, many of them are, um, they're schooled in the uh, responses that we're going to give them. Um, so they already schooled how to answer our responses. So in actual fact, uh, you know, people are quite often misled by them and end up following them because, you know, they know their, their false bits that they need to be pushing. Okay. So that's it for this week.